Okay. Well, again, thank you guys so much for joining us today for this Lunch and Learn. Um, we have on a very special guest, um, Emily Aldridge. Emily and I were in a cohort together for the MSW program at Jacksonville State University. So she is very near and dear to my heart. And I'm very excited to have her on today to talk mm -hmm. about kind of what she's been doing since um, graduation and the kind of line of work that she has found herself in. So Emily, I'm going to go ahead and let you take over. Um, I'll monitor the chat for you, um, let you know if we have anything. But other than that, it is your time awesome. now. Thank you for having me today. Um, we're going to talk about the power of play and building rapport with children and adolescents. Um, so here's kind of a little bit of an outline of how today's PowerPoint and discussion is going to go, um, kind of just to talking about the importance of building rapport and how to do that with play and just the different types of play and just a little bit about the theory and some, um, some you know, information about do's and don'ts in play. Um, so this is me. Uh, I'm Emily Aldridge. Uh, like Faith said, um, I graduated with her from JSU in May of 2021. Um, I have an LMSW and I'm, you know, right now in supervision to become clinically licensed. Um, and so I do work in community mental health in the school-based setting, but um, I've got experience in the outpatient setting as well. And I've worked here since I graduated. Um, and so this summer I trained in parent-child interaction therapy. Um, and so I have kind of like an estimated certi certification, dot, certification date um, next year sometime. Um, but I utilize like therapeutic play nearly every day at work. Um, and I also teach um, therapeutic play techniques to families um, in the parent-child interaction therapy modality. Um, one of my future goals is to become a registered play therapist, um, and that's just going to have to wait until, you know, I'm clinically licensed and have the money and the, um, the time. Um, so, you know, the importance of uh, building rapport. We all know about how important it is to have a good rapport um, with our clients, but just even people in our life that we encounter, you know, even at the grocery store and things like that. Um, you know, so important, you know, it's important just to kind of remember that when we're working with our clients, the rapport is about building trust. Um, and, you know, research suggests that professionals like you guys who are trained to support victims of crime um, can really boost the client outcome through like the proper building of rapport. Um, one study found that interactive activities, aka play, um, made children of all ages more comfortable um, with the forensic interviewer. So that's interesting. Um, another study showed that, you know, building rapport not only, you know, kind of helps the possibility of securing like witness cooperation, but it um, increases the accuracy of the information that they provide. Um, so building rapport is really powerful um, in you guys's you know area. Um, and so when we build rapport with play, um, we're really level in the playing field. Um, play is really just how kids communicate. Um, it's the most familiar mode of expression that a child has. Um, they express their thoughts, their feelings, their experiences through play. Um, and research shows that when a, an adult is willing to play with a child, um, it shows the child that you're interested in them and their world. And it, it honestly levels that power imbalance. Um, so another good reason to build rapport with play is it makes up for any deficits in, you know, emotional understanding, um, willingness to participate, um, or even communication deficits that um, your child client might present with. Um, so here's some just different play techniques and devices. I mean, there's so many, but you've got storytelling, dance, movement, um, imagination, um, you know, sensory items, arts and crafts. I mean, there's so many. Um, and we're going to talk about how to use, you know, different techniques in different ways. Uh, so there's two just very basic types of play. Um, for the first, we have directive play, and that's adult-led play. Um, the second type is non-directive play, and that is child-led play, and they both have important functions in just in different ways. 
Uh, but first, we're going to kind of get into directive play. Um, like I said, uh, this is when the adult leads the play. Uh, the, the adult asks questions, um, gives directions. Um, the, the play has rules and it's curated. Um, the toys and the games are just like carefully chosen to kind of guide the child or you know, the team to a specific um, route. Um, and this is really based off of CBT techniques. Um, and, you know, some ways that we do directive play is, you know, through board games or card games, um, you know, adult led art activities, um, guided imagery, guided meditation, that's all, you know, led by the adult. Um, and here's some visual examples of directive play. You know, we have the classic Uno, uh, Jenga board games. Um, and in this little clip art, you'll see um, these two people are engaging in directive play. Um, and, and it does work to build rapport. Um, and certain kids respond better to directive play. Um, and you can really get creative with directive play, especially if you're trying to build rapport. Um, here you'll see kind of like, um, rapport building Jenga. Um, and that's just, you know, instead of, you know, you're playing Jenga and you're pulling pieces and you're focused on like keeping the tower tall, um, you would put, you know, questions or prompts on each block. And so as you both pull a piece, you both answer. And so you get to know your client. Um, of course, there's also feelings, you know, and that just associates an emotion with the color and you can, you know, be creative. You can, um, every time they get a certain color, you can have that child talk about um, times that they've been angry or times they've coped with anger um, or things like that. There's also the m and feeling game, which is just a fun way um, to incorporate snacks into play. So, you know, I can't think of really anything better than eating candy and um, playing. Um, for a child. <clears throat> Next, we're going to have kind of like directive art activities. Um, so when we're building rapport and you have a child who's interested in art, um, you can do something like this where you kind of, you know, give a prompt. Um, you talk about how um, you can use these prompts in different ways. You can utilize it in, in like you know, pick a prompt and then draw a picture that represents that. Um, you can just talk about it together. You can journal. Um, you know, another directive art activity that I've used a lot is the life in my hands here in the middle. Um, and it's really a nice way to get to know things about your client that maybe they would have not discussed. You not you might not have thought to ask um, them about um, and then here we have this tree of strength. You know, it's a good way to engage um, art and it's also you know putting a strengths-based perspective on um, what the kid likes about themselves it's building self-esteem and building rapport you're getting to know you know the things that the client likes about themselves and that's awesome um, in the middle here in this gray box I just put a little uh, link to just some more ideas if you like you know using directive art um, sometimes, you know, certain people um, really kind of, um, you know, mesh well with the art and it's something that you can kind of keep in a, in a folder and you can travel well with, with, the, with the different art activities. So it's nice to have a few things kind of planned out, you know, in your day, you know, if you were to um, come across a child who's interested in, in doing art with you to, you know, to, to do your sessions. Um, now we're going to talk about non-directive play. Um, and this is child-led play. You know, you're going to let the child pick the toy they play with, how they play with it. Um, you're going to let them completely choose how the direction of your session goes. Um, and this is based off of a Carl Rogers person-centered approach. Um, and your function in this play is just to observe and let the child lead. Um, so it's, you know, our job, it really takes away um, the preparation. All we have to do is be there and be present. Um, now, some things that, you know, are, are good tools to bring to this non-directive play are creative toys like blocks and Legos, magnet tiles, um, pretend sets like dollhouses, um, play food, you know, play money, um, things like that. And here's kind of like, just a verbal, um, not verbal, a visual um, just show of what you could use, um, you know, 
one big hit uh, for the kids that I work with, even from age like five to 18 is kinetic sand. Uh, they really like it. And it's, it's pretty easy and pretty portable as well. Um, another thing that um, I've been using a lot um, is, I, you know, I've got, I've got it here with me. It's um, foam slime and it's great because it doesn't dry out and it doesn't really cause any kind of mess um, and kids love playing with it. I just make them sanitize their hands before and they can play with it. And, um, you know, it brings up a lot of um, communication too. Like they're playing, they're engaging their hands and they're talking about things they probably wouldn't have if they were sitting there, you know, twiddling their thumbs, looking at me nervous. So it lets out a lot of the, um, the anxiety of communicating. Um, so one of the things that uh, we talk about are as the do skills uh, for child-led play, they're called pride skills. Um, and that's going to stand for praise, reflect, imitate, describe, and enjoy. Um, so P for praise um, is going to be where you, the adult, really during play gives a child a labeled praise. Um, you know, you're going to want to notice anything that really positive that they're doing and jump on that with praise. Um, and, and like I said, it's really important for it to be labeled praise versus the unlabeled praise. So an example of that would be um, instead of saying good job, you'll say good job for being creative, you know. Um, so you're really praising them, but also letting them know which behavior to repeat. Um, it could also look like, um, I really like it when you play quietly, um, especially if you have a child that's a little destructive and a little loud, you know, I really like how calm you're being. So you're, you're given that praise and it boosts their self-esteem. Um, and R stands for reflect. Um, and reflect is just to repeat what that child is saying. Um, for example, if the child is building a big tower and they say, I'm building a big tower. You just repeat that. You'll just be like a parrot and you'll say, you're building a big tower. Um, and it feels unnatural at first, but when we, re we reflect what our um, client is saying, it lets them know that we're listening and that uh, we are engaged. Um, and I stands for imitate. Um, and so we imitate the play that the child is doing just to let them know that we approve what they're doing. For example, um, if you have a child who is, again, building a big tower, you could choose to build a big tower alongside of them and you could just, you know, act it out. You don't have to say anything or you could say, I'm going to build a big tower like you are. I like how hard you're working on your big tower. So the skills kind of build on top of each other. Um, and D is going to stand for describe. Um, and this is basically like being a sports announcer. You're going to describe what that child is doing with their hands. For example, they're building that big tower and you say, oh, wow, you're building a big tower. You put the purple block on top of the yellow block. Oh, you put the cow on top of the tower. You know, things like that. You're just going to describe what they're doing with their hands. Um, and E stands for enjoy. So, you know, that's probably the most important one. You know, they you have to let the child know that you're enjoying this interaction with them. You can, you know, you need to give like eye contact and smile and use that warm tone of voice. And, um, you know, just let them know that you're enjoying your time. You appreciate them letting, you know, you into their little world. Essentially, um, they're sharing pieces of themselves with you through play. So the E is probably, in my opinion, the most important part. Um, but now we're going to talk about some things to avoid during child-led play. <laughs> Um, and this is also a little unnatural too, but we're going to try to avoid questions. I and mean, some questions are, you know, bound to happen, um, but we're going to try to avoid the questions. Um, and this is what I teach to my parents uh, undergoing, you know, the parent-child interaction therapy. Um, and the question is like, well, I thought a question would show them that I'm listening and that I am interested in what they're doing. But, you know, in reality, a question kind of takes 
away the um, child's lead from the play. It makes them stop and think, well, why am I doing this? And maybe I shouldn't do this. Um, and it also shows that maybe you're not listening if you're asking questions um, just during this child love play. Um, another thing we're going to avoid is criticism. Um, and so sometimes we don't realize that what we're saying during play could come across as criticism. Um, and I'll give you an example. We're building that big tower again. The child puts you know, the play cow on top of the tower and you say, why did you put a cow on top of the tower? They could perceive that as a criticism. Um, so a better way to put that would be, um, oh, you put the cow on top of the tower. I wonder what the cow is doing on the, on the tower. Um, so a little kind of trick that we use to kind of avoid a question um, is the I wonder. Um, so that statement is appropriate to use during this child-led play. And the last thing we're going to avoid are commands. <laughs> and so a command is really definitely taking the lead away from um, the child in, in terms of play. Even if you're engaging in play, you say something like, oh, hand me the blue block. Um, it's really making them stop and have to bend to what you want to do in the play. Now, the times that I'm going to ask you to not <laughs> avoid commands would be if the child is doing something destructive or dangerous, obviously. Um, and I'll give you a good example of this. Um, during, you know, this child-led play, I've had a child try to climb a bookshelf. And so in that case, you know, you're going to stop <laughs> and you're going to, uh, you're going to, you know, say, hey, get down from there so you don't get hurt or please get down or however you want to word it. But, you know, there are times where we have to bend the rules. So I just like to point that out because um that's this that kind of stuff happens um even something like climbing on top of the table for the younger kids or um you know damaging something you don't want them to damage any of your toys you know these kids can become destructive so there are times where we're gonna you know stop the child-led play and you know use a command but for the most part we're going to avoid questions criticisms and commands okay so applying these techniques as an advocate. Um, so we talked about using it to build rapport um, and that's gonna be a wonderful way to do it. But there are other ways to use play. Um, you can use play as emotional support. Um, you can also use play in crisis intervention and we'll get more into that in a minute. Um, but I like for you to think about this. I want you to be mindful of your individual personality <laughs> and um, things that might cause you distress. Um, for example, um, you want to utilize play, um, but you find that you're maybe a little type A, you like structure, um, and it would be distressing for you if the client took your Play-Doh and mixed the colors together. So we're going to adapt. We're going to kind of think think ahead. We're either going to just avoid using Play-Doh altogether or we are going to only buy one color of Play-Doh. So we have to kind of think about these things that might trigger us and cause us distress. <laughs> you know, um, and, and if you're very type A, you might prefer to have um, this directive play, you know, board games and things with rules. And that might be your preferred way. And that's a great way to build rapport. Um, but if you're very laid back and you kind of want to just let the, the kid lead, you can, the non-directive play is great for building rapport too. Um, I will say that non-directive play where you let the child lead is, um, in my opinion, a lot easier to use with the younger children, um, maybe children four, five, six, seven, um, if they're not really able to kind of follow, you know, um, the rules of a card game or something like that, letting them have that child-led creative play um, seems to work really well. Um, but like I said, there's instances where the directive to play, it, it could be a better fit for the child. So bear in mind your personality as well as the child's. Um, an example of that would be um, if you have a, a client who is very shy and reserved, maybe indecisive, maybe fearful of making a wrong choice. Um, and so in that case, you know, directive play really alleviates the stress of them having to pick what to play. 
So and that would be a great time to um, bring out a card game with rules or a board game or one of the, you know, directive art activities. Um, which leads me into the next suggestion is to be prepared. Um, and I say that because kids are um, ever changing. You could have um, a session with a client for four months straight in which they discussed how they wanted to be an artist when they grew up and that you do art activities with them each time. They love it. And then, you and you know, all of a sudden they don't like art anymore. Um, they don't want to do that. Maybe they're not in the mood to make art. So it's good to be prepared with, you know, some different options. Um, but, you know, I don't want you to be overwhelmed either. Um, I don't have an office and I go into the schools. And so all I do is kind of bring a bag with me. So I'm not going to bring a whole play therapy room full of full of toys and, and things. So the, you know, the best advice I can give you is to just bring a small variety or have a small variety. Um, so what I usually bring with me in my therapy bag, just to be prepared for, you know, different age ranges and, you know, different interests and things like that, different personalities. I like to bring a sensory item, um, like the, the foam slime I was telling you about that I'm, that I'm, fan of right now um or kinetic sand um I like to always have a card game and I have a few that I rotate out um I like to have some art activities prepared and just a, a good old pack of crayons is is what all some children really need um and you know I'll rotate out a board game or two um and that's really all I do I'm not I'm not bringing a whole lot because you know they can be overwhelmed by the choice of, of things like that. But as far as the um, child led play, I'll bring a small thing of Legos or, um, you know, like stackable magnet tiles, things like that. Um, maybe like I'll rotate out the pretend sets, um, but you don't have to have a whole lot and you can even shop yard sales and things like that. I have found um, Legos and blocks and things like that um, on, you know, the, you know, yard sale sites, the, the, the resale sites and things like that. Um, now back to how to incorporate play in different ways. Um, we talked about how to use it to build rapport and why it's important, especially in, you know, in your field. Um, but the emotional support aspect, and I've used play for emotional support with children's teens and adults. Um, an example of that would be um, a client who is very um, anxious, you know, you're noticing that they're fidgeting, they're wringing their hands, um, they're having a hard time, you know, focusing because they're just so anxious, um, you know, a sensory item, you know, uh, putty slime, you know, yeah, slime actually triggers me, so just be mindful of that can be a mess, um, but, you know, even like a a, um, a stress ball, um, anything like that can really help kind of regulate the client um, and let them have that, you know, like a, an outlet for that nervous energy so that they can communicate better. Um, so I just play, you know, even with my parents sometimes when they're very anxious or nervous or even angry. So it helps them to have like a way to regulate. Um, so we talked about play building rapport play having um, an aspect of emotional support. Now, um, lastly, let's talk about play in crisis intervention. Um, and I've seen a lot of my colleagues do this. Um, so I have what is called, I call it my go bag. Um, when I have a call and someone's like, okay, you have a client in crisis. Oh, I grab my go bag and I, um, you know, take it with me and it has, you know, just some little different elements of play. I have a stuffed animal in there that has some uh, lavender and vanilla scent for calming. I have some sensory items, you know, I'll have um, maybe even, you know, in the past I've had bubbles in there because, you know, that can mimic like a deep breathing, you know, you're breathing in and you're breathing out and it's regulating. Um, I also have like some, some sunglasses in there for pretend play, a little hat, you know, sometimes the fluorescent lights can be too much though. They can, you know, have a sensory break. Um, you know, it's not play related, but I'll have a snack and water. Um, but the reason it works sometimes 
it's not even the play. Sometimes it is just, if they're in true crisis or having a panic attack, sometimes just unzipping the bag and looking in and seeing what's in the bag and observing is enough to disrupt that panic and, you know, disrupt the thought. And so sometimes I notice by the time they've put their hand in the bag, they've already regulated a lot. So you can use play and incorporate that into crisis intervention as well. Um, so I guess this is, I went through this really fast. So this is the part where um, if you guys have any questions or if you need me to clarify anything since I went through this so fast, um, I'm all ears. Oh, yeah, okay. So um, let's see. Obviously the older kids get the less relevant play, but could you touch on how this is implemented for older kids a bit more? Yes. Um, so my older kids, um, they don't really respond as well to the child-led play with the imagination as much in terms of play sets. Um, for example, you know, I probably wouldn't bring play money or um, a tea party set or, you know, farm set or anything like that for my older kids, but they really love Legos. Um, they really love the advanced Lego sets. Um, even my kids really like the magnet tiles and you can really let them play with it while they talk. And um, sometimes it's just a kind of like, you know, engaging their hands and their senses and they can talk more easily. But sometimes they'll create like a world. Like I've had kids create a safe place, you know, like older teens even create a safe place with the Legos or um, when I bring sand or really kinetic sand, I have a little, little tiny sand tray um, they'll build a, a, a place in, in the sand tray that is their safe world or kind of give me a glimpse into their world. So um, that's one way that the child-led play kind of manifests in the um, older kids and the teens. Um, and of course, you know, if we are going to go and see high schoolers, we're probably not going to bring Candyland board games. Um, and they're probably tired of Uno, but now some of them love Uno. Some of them are really competitive. But, you know, you can bring more advanced games like the Game of Life. Um, and the Game of Life is really cool because it brings up different concepts, of, especially for my seniors of like, where am I going to work? Um, what will my life be like? I mean, so... Um, there's definitely like directive play that works really well for the older kids. Um, so we have the board games, the card games. Um, some of my older kids have had a lot of fun um, teaching me how to play poker and how to play um, rummy and things like that. And I'm really bad at following directions. So they, they get a, you know, they get a big kick out of like having to teach me and remind me of the rules and stuff. And so that in a way builds communication and confidence for them. So and play has a lot of different functions. I mean, um, in the therapy world, you know, play has the function of obviously building rapport like you guys would use it. Um, but it also kind of builds self-esteem and lets the child and the adolescent, you know, the teen feel heard and things like that. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of other things. Um, and it is totally dependent on the personality of the, the teenage client. I mean, I have some, especially my, uh, my girl clients really like art. And so we'll do some abstract art. So that's really child led. Um, if they take, uh, watercolors and they, you know, do an abstract piece, that's, you know, that's really letting them kind of put the art on the paper and kind of tell me about what that means to them. Um, and then I've also done really directive art with my older kids. So um, I think it's really kind of just having different options and then being prepared for the different personalities. Um, and it's true. Some of my, you know, older clients, my teenagers, they, they don't want to play. They just want to talk. Uh, and that's great because that means that they have learned abstract thought. They're, they're working on their communication. They're they're talking about what they want to talk about. So, I mean, yeah, absolutely. There are just some clients that, you know, play um, isn't really what they're interested in. Um, but I will say, even my adults love a good sensory item. Uh, something about just having something in their hands, even a ball to throw back and forth, helps them to regulate and kind of 
you know, help them guide the, the conversation and talk about the things that they wanted to talk about. Um, but thank you for that question, Kaylee. Do you have, did that kind of answer it for you? I hope it did. Oh, you're welcome. And yeah, I, I'm surprised how much my older kids like uh, Legos and they're expensive, but especially if you can get something like um, the Legos that are like Star Wars themed or, you know, the adult Legos that are like a, a real pretty like replica of a flower. They love that. And it's hard to do that in one hour sessions, um, but they take it on as a good challenge. All right. If we have any more questions, I'd be happy to answer, but I know I've rambled a lot. <laughs> I think that you explained it so well there are no questions because <laughs> I was racking my brain to think of a question and I was like, I think you covered the topic very, very, very well and very thorough, which oh, I well, thank you. I, um I, I think I might have went, you know, a little too in depth on some of it because, you know, it, it's one of those things where you really just go person by person. It's, yeah. it's you know, you just have to go by, based on their personality and everything like that. Well, thank you, Jenny. I appreciate that. Jenny is one of our interns this semester. Oh, awesome. She's in um, MSW. Want to oh. do clinical, so. Oh, that is so cool. Well, to know. Oh, thank you, Kaylee. I, well, I'm like very passionate about play. So I'm like all like into, yeah. you know, the theory behind it and everything like that. But really um, just connecting with the kid is like the main thing. Um, sometimes people don't realize how few adults take the time to listen to a child. So just even listening um, is is beneficial. I think that what I really liked about your presentation was usually when you hear that there's a play um, or like any topic, it kind of just skims the surface, but I liked the applicable items you gave. Like, this is what I do when I work with um, kids in clinic. This is groups that I found this to work on. This is kind of how it helps. So I think that that's really important and that's kind of what I look for in trainings. So I appreciated that you did that because I know that at least I know Jenny and a couple of our interns are on here and that's definitely something that can be taken away and put into their own practice. And for uh, me as well, I will say I have used um, feelings uno or emotions uno with college kids before. And yeah. it's just, it's it's a nice, nice breakup of things too, just to kind of like have a little bit more than just talking. Um, mm -hmm. It looks like Kaylee agrees, definitely. And that's why I had Emily on because I knew she would give us the, oh, okay. the whole spill. <laughs> well, I think, you know, when you work with 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 people in general, I mean, even adults, like they like certain personalities, likes and direction. You know, that's why we use worksheets a lot and things like that. So, I mean, it kind of goes throughout the ages. But the research that I found for um, victim advocates and the rapport and the play, that was very compelling to me. Um, you know, I, I'm new to, I, I don't really know anything that's, you know, your uh, area of expertise, but I was trying to make it relevant. Um, so that was very interesting research for me. I was very fascinated by how that, you know, quality rapport could, could lead to like a better, 
um, like interview with the forensic interviewer. That just blew my mind. I was like, wow, there's a lot more to it than I realized. Definitely. Yeah, you, you'd you be shocked. And I think you could say there's a lot of aspects about our work with the very <clears throat> small things that you can do and include to make the experience 10 times better for yeah. someone coming in. Um, mm -hmm. Jenny said, absolutely agree with you, Faith. I love the suggestions of sensory items for older kids and even adults. Kinetic sand is so soothing for my kids and even me, and I never considered bringing that in. What a great and simple tool for lots of groups of people of various ages. Um Kaylee said, I feel like adults or older kids, it could be so beneficial as a distraction or fidget type thing while talking about tough stuff. Yeah. 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 And like the um, bilateral stimulation we talk about with that's associated with EMDR. I think that's why it's so helpful for them to have something to, you know, play with in both of their hands. I think it's like engaging both sides of the brain and kind of maybe even in some way helping them process and regulate. So I think there's a lot more science to it than, than I really know. But um, one day when I'm a play therapist, I'll come back and I'll, and I'll give, you know, a better, a better, you know, overview. But the, the cool thing about play therapy is um, when you become a registered play therapist, I mean, you have devoted like five years of your life to learning and training. So it's, it's very, you know, in depth. And when, by the time that you are a registered play therapist, you are extremely qualified and competent. Um, so that's my goal. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and you know, it's one of the, but you can use play. I mean, you don't have to be registered. You just can say you're using play techniques. So, you know, even if, if some of you guys, you know, go into your, another internship or when you go into the field and you, you get a job, maybe at community, community mental health or whatever you do and you're, and you're providing therapy, you can use play techniques. Um, you just, you know, find what works for you. And so, and I encourage anybody to try and use play. Oh, I'm, uh, I live in Clay County, but I am with Alta Point Health Systems. Um, we're a community mental health agency. Um, so I am a, a school-based therapist in Talladega County. So you're a lot closer to us than I even realized. You're like, yeah, I guess yeah. I never, because we, we just picked up Randolph. Really? Okay. So, yeah getting we're probably with one of ours um with it's probably outlying um Talladega, yeah but yeah um yeah definitely the Opelika area is only about maybe an hour and 15 minutes away it's not too it's not too far yeah. um and so yeah and that is a great area to be in too there's a lot of resources and I love that for y'all because you know in these rural rural counties there's you know, not as many resources and we struggle to link people to, you know, relevant resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, well, if there's no more questions, um, then we will, I guess, get out of here a little bit early today. Um, checking the chat one more time. Yeah. And I'm going to put my email in the chat. It's just RCA services. It's what you would have gotten this um, Zoom from. And if you have any other questions, I can direct them Emily's way. Um, and if, I'm gonna stop the recording now actually. <laughs>